Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special episode of Market Masters. Our guest today is an erudite gentleman who, over the last three decades in the last street, has researched and invested in a host of mid cap companies, which are now 8,000 point gorillas. We are both privileged and honored to welcome Mr. Utpal Seth. He's the co founder and mentor of Trust Group of Financial Services Companies and, of course, the senior partner and Chief Executive Officer of Rare Enterprises, the investment arm of the late Mr. Rakesh Chundunwala. Good afternoon to you, sir, and what a pleasure to have you. It's both a privilege and an honor to see you with us. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. So uh, this episode is a result of uh, uh, the first equity offering of Trust Mutual Fund and Asset Management Company, which is the Trust FlexiCap Fund. The trust group of companies is more towards the debt capital side of uh, investment banking as also on the advisory and wealth asset management size. Overall, they advise and uh, uh, research on about 20,000 crore rupees worth of assets. Uh, Mr. Seth, uh, I just wanted to start this conversation uh, on your understanding of this structural bull market that is unfolding on uh, the Lal Street. Uh, does it have legs? Is it still young? And is there a long time to go? So thank you for asking that question. If you permit me, I'll go back a little in time. Um, sometime in June 2002, Rakesh ji and I co-authored an article in Economic Times about a structural and secular bull run in India. And you know, it just amazes me to see how Rakesh ji's vision of 2002 has panned out and is still in play in 2024. Uh, he was truly a visionary and I am privileged to have learnt from him and with him over all these years. Today I think India is at a very uh, fortunate uh, you know, position. I would say India is an idea whose time has come. Yeah. I would say today that India is in the process of earning the right to be an asset class amongst all emerging markets. I don't think any of us could have envisioned uh, that India would be in such a fortuitous position, especially relative to the way the other the rest of the world is behaving or uh, in relation to their economic circumstances and our economic circumstances. Indian uh, equity markets historically were driven by foreign capital. I think a dramatic change has happened in the last 5-7 years and these changes that have happened have made India being driven by domestic capital rather than foreign capital. And this, uh, these changes have happened by design and not by default. Okay. The first big change happened in the way that our regulations pertaining to provident funds and pension funds were changed. I call that the 401k movement. These, these changes took place in 2016-17. The next big change happened in the way the incentive system for financial product distribution was re-engineered yes. and that is resulting in a monthly flow into equity markets which have brought down structurally the volatility in Indian equity markets. I think it has changed the demand supply equation of Indian equities. The third big change that has happened is the dramatic reduction in the government disinvestments. Hmm. So the supply has been taken away? Yes, a part of the supply has been taken away. And I think the rest of the Indian corporate sector has deleveraged dramatically the tax framework for equity as an asset class is significantly more favorable as compared to other asset classes 
and all of these factors are resulting in a, a very favorable demand supply equation for equities. Okay. So what now from here? We are already, you know, uh, 75,000 on the Sensex and all other major indices that we see are on a multi-year record high. How longer is this bull market going to stay with us? What are the possible pitfalls and uh, how do you see this uh, uh, taking shape over the next, let's say, three years? I don't have concerns on valuations for Indian capital markets. There may be pockets of uh, froth, but it is localized and not generalized. Clearly, I still see significant opportunities to invest in all around me. So I don't um, feel that there are constraints to investors investing in India today. In my interface with global investors, the sense that I get is that they are all waiting for India to become a little more cheaper uh, on valuation front. Yes. But they can keep on waiting. The fact is that the domestic capital has the belief in India and the domestic capital is the driving force in Indian equity markets today. Okay. One interesting thing, uh, uh, Mr. Said, that has also happened is that uh, when you talk about domestic capital, uh, it used to have this uh, fear of uh, flight. Whenever you see a downtrend in the markets, uh, this money would, you know, it was scared money, if I may use that phrase. But it's an opposite trend now. The deeper the markets fall or the deeper the correction, more money comes in. How do you think that kind of a support that comes in at lower levels has changed uh, uh, the dynamics of the domestic market? I think that reflects the maturity and the evolution of Indian equity investors. Um, their belief in the long term potential of India is that much greater and is reflected in their actions. They are putting their money where their mouth is. So, I, yeah. So, um, what that has resulted in is a structural reduction in volatility in yes. Indian equity markets. And a structural reduction in volatility in Indian equity markets should result in a lowering of the equity risk premium. However, let's step back a little and not just look at it as risk to the equity markets, but look at other financial and economic parameters. Mm -hmm. I see that the inflation differentials between India and other countries have yes. diminished structurally. I see that the interest rate differentials between India and other countries have diminished structurally. And I see that the volatility of our exchange rate has reduced structurally. Mm -hmm. Given the structural reduction in all of these parameters, I would say that the there is a structural reduction in the risk of investing in India. Okay. Okay. And the markets are reflecting that. Okay. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritties of uh, equity investing, I'd just like to understand your view on how India's macro balance sheet has uh, improved over the last five, seven years or so. And how do you see it uh, uh, improving further over the next uh, maybe decade or so. GST is of course an innovation that has uh, dramatically improved the government's finances as also you know things like fast tag. In fact the entire digitization process has uh, uh, dram dramatically improved the way we look at our balance sheet. What are your views? I think the many structural changes and reforms that have taken place in India over the years are all coming together. Um, this is one of the reasons that I said that India is an idea whose time has come. Uh, the coming together of all of these changes uh, is, has resulted in uh, a dramatic improvement in India's economic profile. But also the confluence of all of these changes, structural changes has resulted in India's uh, economic profile being in amongst the strongest position that I have seen in many, many years. 
whether it is on the external front mm -hmm. in terms of forex reserves or even current account deficit or on the internal front in terms of the fiscal deficits etc or even debt to gdp government debt to gdp however let me add that the changes are not just at a macroeconomic level so we are seeing a phenomenal improvement in the strength of our banking system today as compared to many years ago third i would say is the strength of the corporate sector today yes as compared to many years ago not only has the corporate debt to equity come down significantly but also we are seeing a wave of consolidation across multiple sectors absolutely okay we are seeing a structural shift away from unorganized sector to organized sector mm -hmm. with greater compliance and greater scalability in general uh, the reduction in the corporate tax rate in september 19 Uh, to 25 percent, I think has also given a big boost to corporate cash flows, which is why the uh, corporate profit as a percentage of GDP, listed corporate profit as a percentage of GDP, has more than doubled uh, since COVID times, and I think there is still scope for improvement there. So, putting all of this together. i feel that the systemic vulnerabilities have diminished greatly okay okay uh mr seth uh, you are one of the finest uh, uh, equity researchers in the market and that's uh, also because of uh, uh, the gentleman that you've worked with for so long uh you've uh, found out and researched and invested in a host of mid caps uh, you know such as titan such as uh, concord biotech crystal just to name a few what took you so long to launch an equity product so first of all i have been privileged to have learned from mr junjunwala and even other mentors uh, in my career but i will say that those companies were mid cap companies when we invested in them in the mid 2000s they are all large cap companies absolutely. now absolutely <laughs> and uh, rakesh you always used to say that he remembers seeing a sticker behind a maruti 800 vehicle yes in which uh, the sticker says that when i grow up i want to be a mercedes benz absolutely right so uh, it, it, it's been a fantastic journey to have walked along with these investing companies of ours mm -hmm. over how they have uh, evolved and the journey Uh, has been not it's not just about the returns uh, it's about the learnings, learnings absolutely no um, my question was uh, slightly different what i wanted to ask was that you are familiar with equities trust uh, as a group of financial companies is uh, perhaps the biggest non bank uh, debt capital market investment bank and of course you advise uh, uh, a whole host of uh, uh, private wealth owners uh, over uh, wealth management and advisory about 20000 crore rupees what made you look towards the retail side to launch your first uh, uh, equity mutual fund see investing has been a passion for me since very early days i started my career uh, with ask financial when i was 18 years old so that's a very early start and uh, i feel that mutual fund is the most scalable the most uh, the uh, the vehicle with the largest reach absolutely to take investing to each and every uh, indian truly speaking mm -hmm. i i i think it's a privilege to be able to invest on behalf of so many indians and to participate in their journey of wealth creation uh, in the many years to come mutual fund sector i think plays a very important role in channelizing savings mm -hmm. okay india 2 uh, 3 decades ago was always deficient in risk capital i think mutual funds are a very critical uh, component of channelizing risk capital in the economy so i think it's a privilege for us to be 
um, part of that journey. Okay, so now we have a structural bull market in place, uh, which is still young. The macro balance sheet is absolutely in the pink of health. Uh, cost of launching a fund and of course uh, uh, getting those assets under management has reduced dramatically over the last five years thanks to digitization. Now let's look at the product. You have a FlexiCap fund uh, uh, which is uh, uh, collecting money on uh, behalf of the AMC from retail institutional investors. How will it be different from the 29 or 30 FlexiCap funds that we already have in the market? How will Trust FlexiCap be different in terms of managing the money? What is your USP? Thank you for asking that question. I think Trust uh, Mutual Fund is a very late entrant um, on a relative terms. But I think the whole industry is still very young mm. and therefore I have no regrets being an entrant at this point of time. My belief in the next two, three, four decades uh, about India and about the Indian mutual fund sector um, convinced me that this, there is no problem entering now. Secondly, we were very conscious that we will enter the equity mutual fund space only when we have the most capable and committed team that we could find. We took our time to do that. Even after finding that team and building that team, I wanted to ensure that the culture, the processes, the discipline and the focus that we brought to the table were something that I would be confident of and proud of. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, Mihir Vora, who is the Chief Investment Officer uh, now with us, who has, who is a veteran of Indian yes. markets, has um, had a role with multiple financial institutions, both mutual funds, insurance companies and global investment organizations. So I think we have all the ingredients in place. In terms of how we are different, yes. I think we bring a unique investment approach or investment philosophy to the table. We advocate and hope to practice a methodology which we define as terminal value investing. Okay. And this is a different approach. I'm sure you've heard of various investing methodologies no, like value investing, growth investing, quality investing, momentum investing. At the moment, we are uh, uh, debating between value and growth. So where does terminal stand? I think clearly terminal value is closer to growth, hmm. but uh, I think it is much more than just growth. Okay. What are the four or five main ingredients of uh, terminal investing? So let me first define terminal value investing. Terminal value investing is difficult to appreciate at first flush. Right. Um, the conventional interpretation of terminal value is in a discounted cash flow methodology. Fair point. Where there is a mathematical formula to terminal value. Our belief is that that's not the best way of looking at it. Terminal value is something that is in the distant future. It's not easy to perceive. It's a nebulous concept. concept. Uh, it's not obvious. And it is dynamic. It's not static. Right? There are multiple vari variables that impact terminal value. However, terminal value has to act as your North Star. Fair point. Right? It is your guiding factor for all decision making. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was Eric Smith who said that we all uh, overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. Given that terminal value is a long term concept, I believe we are structurally and seriously underestimating terminal value. Okay. Is this a number in relation to the stock price or uh, is this uh, something which is ephemeral or nebulous just as you mentioned? It is ephemeral and nebulous and not a hard number. Okay. Um, 
if you permit me the analogy i would draw is that you are at the base camp of mount everest and you look up but you can't see mount everest because there are lots of clouds visibility is poor etc right that does not mean that mount everest is not there okay and you don't need to measure the precise height of mount everest to know that it's very 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 tall you can still know that it is there is a very very tall mountain out there so and that is enough for you to then start climbing okay so my belief is that if you can perceive the terminal value and the key drivers of that terminal value of any company then your ability to ability to invest in that company with conviction and courage mm. to buy with the patience and equanimity to hold gives you the ability to not just buy to not just hold but to also add every time that there is volatility in the markets and i think that the third element is such a crucial element of investing which most people um uh, don't give adequate importance to actually uh, we live in an environment where uh, people come in for 2 3 months even in mutual funds uh, forget about uh, you know individual stock investing i think the whole concept of uh, you know holding a patient uh, uh, investment in your uh, uh, portfolio has uh, changed uh, uh maybe because of the increased computerization that we've seen in india or uh, uh, just that people uh, in the age group that is dominant are uh, not patient there is a beautiful poem by rudyard kipling mm. called if and i do not recollect the exact words but if i take the liberty of summarizing it then it says that if you can keep your head on your shoulders hmm while everybody around you is losing theirs then that is part of the process of being uh a mature permit me to take that argument a little further the one on the base camp and uh, uh mount everest we know the height of mount everest as 8848 meters the base camp is uh, i would imagine uh, 3000 meters below uh, this actual level when you talk about terminal value investing uh it's a nebulous con- uh, concept at the top but uh, in the given uh, uh, market conditions uh how would you say uh, what is the terminal value of uh, any blue chip company that comes to your mind for the lack of a better example let's take titan i won't be able to comment on any specific stock but Fair. let us talk about the concept i don't think anybody is god and therefore nobody has the ability to say that this is the terminal value usually in um most people compare the price today yes. to the value today and if they find that the price today is substantially less than the value today they will buy and if the price today is substantially more than the value today they will sell my submission is in terminal value investing you compare the price today with the value 10 years from now hmm. okay that is to, in my mind the terminal value as i said before it is not static it is dynamic so as you come closer to that terminal value the terminal value is also moving, moving forward ahead. in time yes right but you don't need to know the precise i mean if it was not 8848 and if it was 8960 is it that you will not climb it is it that it is not the tallest mountain on earth hmm it will still be you don't need to know the precise 8848 right therefore i am saying one has to embrace that degree of uncertainty keep faith in that vision and move forward however let's say you start with a 10 stock portfolio yes right and you go right on two or three of them and they turn out to be having that terminal value and become gorilla companies in your portfolio and maybe two or three you figure out are not gorillas but are actually monkeys and therefore you will exit from them mm. and the other three four you are still not sure of whether they will eventually be gorillas or not mm. you need to give them more time but every time you exit from 
the monkeys you keep adding other companies which you expect will be gorillas and maybe again you will not be right on all some of them will not be but in this way as you evolve over a period of time a larger and larger percentage of your portfolio will be comprised of gorillas okay if i am able to understand this concept uh, uh, these companies uh, which are uh, uh, about to be gorillas will have a very decent uh, financial performance uh, already behind them because based on some parameters of uh, uh, the number crunching that you do only will you be able to sort out uh, a catchment of companies which may later become gorillas so uh, these are not newbies these are existing uh, large mid caps which might become blue chips or uh, bigger blue chips uh, in the times to come gorilla investing is both quantitative and qualitative okay the qualitative factors are more important but how are these gorilla companies linked with terminal value okay terminal value investing is what we advocate but what is terminal value driven by terminal value is driven by three key components the first is that those companies are participating in some mega trend which means you have a structural tailwind behind you you are targeting a very large addressable opportunity only then can you be a high terminal value company the second is you need to have some leadership characteristics you have to have some edge you could be the largest player but that's not the only leadership attribute there are other leadership attributes you could have a better business model you could have better uh, risk management you could be the least cost player it's a differentiator a differentiator which is sustainable hmm that's what i would call as a leadership attribute however you will have these leadership attributes only if you have the third factor which is, which is intangibles mm. okay in the good old days it used to be i have the biggest plant mm. but those tangibles are no longer your differentiators differentiators and no longer the most important value drivers the most important value drivers are the soft aspects which we call as intangibles it could be the goodwill you enjoy with your customers it could be the culture that you built in your company it could be the brand it could be your distribution network and so on there are many possible intangibles i think when you find the intersection of mega trends leadership and intangibles those companies go on to become gorilla companies okay and go- they become gorilla companies because they have those outsized terminal values okay so uh, given that uh, uh, the flexi cap portfolio uh, is probably still in the making i just want to understand uh, are you somehow advocating that passive investing holding for uh, uh, the real long term uh, what we used to learn more than 10 years uh, uh, if not more and if not uh, actually infinity uh, is the way to go to create so super normal wealth in this uh, you know time and age where people want to square up their positions intraday even those that they buy on the cat side having a long term perspective does not mean that you buy and go to sleep hmm i think it is incumbent upon every investment manager to be watchful to be aware of all the changes that are taking place and to keep assessing from time to time how terminal value is shaping so there will need to be decision making as i explained to you if you buy 10 companies not all 10 companies are going to be gorilla gum so you will have to make those corrections so it's not that this is a passive form of investing yes it's a disciplined form of investing it's a focused form of investing let me just uh, play the devil's advocate here mr sater uh, of course markets have their ups and downs and a lot of investment uh, uh, how should i say thesis and uh, uh, 
frames uh, go up and down at the moment at least in the indian market uh, the concept of buy at any price uh, you know of quality stocks in at least my lifetime that have delivered multi bagger returns uh, has not been exactly very effective so when you talk about terminal value when you talk about uh, uh, you know mid caps com mid cap companies turning to uh, large blue chips uh, is there uh, you know some element of uh, this buy at any price uh, also being factored in um i don't want to comment upon the investment philosophy and approach of other investment managers it's mm. not right i mean different things work for different people i can only talk about what we think works for us right and we it's not that uh, we are advocates of the same philosophy mm. that you were talking about we are quite clear we are disciplined investors and therefore we will be conscious of the valuations that we pay but the price that we pay has to be seen in the context of the value that we perceive 10 years from now fair point not just the value that we perceive today hmm. right now in that phase i'm sure we it's uh, it's possible that we will not always be able to buy at the best price and that is okay as we have all learned the formula for compounding mm. is a is equal to p bracket 1 plus r raised to n n yes. everybody focuses on increasing the r right okay. whereas our focus is the n yes if we can get that compounding for longer yes. then i think it's a very powerful outcome um that has been my experience in investing in the last 30 odd years that i have been in the markets uh, and that is the experience uh, and the learning that i will advocate absolutely so let's come to the second part of this uh, uh, lovely conversation the n and in this i just uh, like to uh, ask you about the learnings that you had from the late mr junjunwala and especially on uh, you know the kind of companies that you've researched invested and uh, made tons of money you know stocks like crystal titan concord bio and of course the recently listed metro brands what were your three main learnings from mr junjunwala so one again i'll reiterate that i will not comment on individual stocks um i have learned a lot from mr junjunwala not just about markets not just about investing mm. but also about people also about life okay so one of the most important things i've learned from him about life is that we value people for who they are rather than for what they have okay right and uh, that has helped mr junjunwala form some phenomenal relationships over the years and like investing relationships also compound absolutely second is Uh, Mr. Junwal always used to say that making a mistake is not a crime. Repeating a mistake is a crime. Not learning from a mistake is the worst crime. Right? So keeping an open mind and having a high degree of learnability is very important in your evolution um, in life and as an investor. Therefore. Uh, like we discussed compounding in relationships as in investing i would say there is compounding in knowledge and learning as well so this was this would be the second important learning that i would talk about the third learning that i would talk about is he used to tell us that your patience may be tested but your conviction will be rewarded so in investing your conviction is very important if you have not built your conviction you will not be able to build the courage to buy and even if you can build the courage to buy without the conviction that is just foolhardy second is if you don't have conviction you will never have patience mm. the foundation of your patience has to be your conviction so these are the three things that uh, uh, possibly are more explained on the uh, the ephemeral and the nebulous side 
Coming to hardcore markets, you know, what were your learnings uh, from him as far as the balance sheet is concerned, as far as, you know, holding a stock for the long term is concerned. Uh, maybe something on momentum as well. He was uh, uh, one of the finest players on the side of momentum as well. What were your, what were your learnings from that side? So I think uh, Rakesh Ji or Bhaiya as we used to call him was an unmitigated genius who was very good at trading as well as very good at investing. Those are actually two very, very... Opposite, diametrically opposite threads. Yes. Um, the mental mind makeup that you need for each of those are totally different. And which is why I use the word genius, because genius is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time, which Mr. Junjunwala was. I think to have, while we are talking about terminal value and conviction, in companies, Mr. Junjunwala had this unbeatable conviction in India mm. over the years. He was India's biggest bull. Of course. But he was a bull because of his conviction in India, not just a bull because of him expecting better prices. I think he was more bullish on India than he was on markets. Hmm. Okay. And that gave him the ability to back his conviction in the face of any adversity, any volatility. And his conviction gave him the ability to back up the truck and buy when the opportunity arose. I think being able to have those convictions and that courage was important. Okay. Uh, Mr. Seth, just as there is a terminal value in investing, there is a also a terminal point when all uh, wonderful conversations draw to a close. And uh, we've reached that time uh, as far as today's episode is concerned. The very best of luck to you as far as uh, the present launch is concerned. Of course, this is the first equity product from your stable. We hope to see many more from Trust Asset Management Company and may all of them succeed beyond your wildest dreams. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Much appreciate your good wishes. Thank you. This ladies and gentlemen was uh, Mr. Utpal Seth, uh, the co-founder and mentor at uh, Trust Asset Management Company and Mutual Funds. Their first product, the Trust FlexiCap Fund is open for investing and you've listened over the last 45 minutes what the thesis for picking up those stocks was. Uh, I hope it has been an exciting show for you just as it has been a great learning experience for me. Thank you so much for your time and your listening in. Thank you. Thank you.